from the offices of the Hoover Institution in Washington. From world champion blueberry picker at the age of 20 to the first woman in American history to manage a successful presidential campaign. With us today, Kellyanne Conway. Uncommon knowledge now. Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson. Raised in southern New Jersey, Kellyanne Conway spent eight summers supplementing the family income by picking blueberries and was so successful that at the age of 20, she became the world champion blueberry picker. Mrs. Conway received a BA in political science from Trinity College and a JD from George Washington University Law School. In 1995, she started her own company, The Polling Company, where her corporate clients included American Express and Hasbro, and her political clients included Jack Kemp, Fred Thompson, Dan Quayle, Newt Gingrich, and Mike Pence. This past August, Donald Trump named Mrs. Conway his campaign manager, and this coming January 20th, two events will take place. Her client will take the oath of office as the 45th President of the United States, and Mrs. Conway will celebrate her 50th birthday. Kellyanne, welcome. Thank you, Peter. Two quotations. CBS correspondent Leslie Stahl appearing recently on Charlie Rose. She's discussing her 60 Minutes interview with Donald Trump. Quote, I saw a man who was having the weight of what he's getting into hitting him. He is the leader of the free world, and there's no question that he's feeling it. No question. That's number one. Here's number two, David Remnick in The New Yorker, reporting on the president-elect's meeting with the media on November 22nd. Quote, Trump showed no signs of having been sobered or changed by the elevation to the country's highest office. Rather, said one attendee, he is the same kind of blustering blowhard as he was during the campaign. Close quote. Describe to us the state of the president-elect's mind as we come down to a small number of weeks before he takes the oath of office? Well, the president-elect of the United States is very focused, very engaged, very excited to take that oath of office and be our nation's president. Peter, this country just did what it said it wanted to do for a number of decades, which is to put into office a true outsider, someone who owes no one anything in Washington, D.C., and someone who's really a non-politician. And you saw that as he built his campaign. It was not a typical political campaign because he's not, not a typical politician. It was a movement. And I have to agree with Ms. Stahl on the following point. He does understand the gravity of this office. He's been preparing for this for a number of years. And most recently, during transition, he and Vice President-elect Mike Pence have been talking to, I think now they're up to about 75 or 80 potential advisors or opinion leaders, men and women, some of whom will end up in the cabinet or in his senior staff, but all of whom are coming to him with their ideas and their experiences and their vision. Donald Trump is a master listener and learner. He takes the counsel of a number of people, but there is no question that he is the ultimate decision maker and he is brilliant. The man is brilliant. He's a, a great negotiator, a very decisive leader, and somebody who executes and delivers, you know, somebody who's held accountable for the results. I coordinated that media meeting. I was I going to say, right you, well, you to must him. want to talk back to David Remnick's I, account. I, I, David Remnick was not in the room. I, I sat right next to Donald Trump. It was a healthy conversation between the main street, the media, and our president-elect, whom I like to say will be sharing the custody of the country for the next four to eight years. And so it's important that that relationship flourish and be a little bit more honest and open than perhaps it has been. Uh, I, I think quantitatively- He's going to talk back to these guys. Well, quantitatively, Peter, my goodness. I mean, has anybody ever been criticized to this extent through this many sources, through this many media in a given day? We have online sources and social media and radio and TV and print media. It's truly relentless. And you had journalists in the Washington Post, New York Times, and other places, saying on the record that Donald Trump forced them to suspend all standards of objective journalism just to cover his race. That's just an astonishing admission. Absolutely. And, and it, one thing I want yeah. to say about the media, just from the beginning, because mm -hmm. I have good relationships with the media. I consider that, I, I, I think that's true. But here's the issue there. The idea that the media failed to prepare the American people 
for the possibility that Donald Trump would win the presidency, it's a failing. He showed he understands America, and they showed that they, they need to learn more about America. We'll come back to Donald Trump, but first a moment or two about Kellyanne Conway. You grew up in New Jersey. That's a democratic state. Your dad was a truck driver. Your mom worked in a casino in Atlantic City. That's a blue collar, typically democratic background. Uh, your parents divorced when you were little. You're raised by your mom, a grandmother, two maiden aunts, single mothers, single women skew democratic. Why aren't you a Democrat? I'll, I'll go a couple of steps farther. Um, half Irish, half Italian, both Democratic significant Democratic groups, constituencies, right, right. certainly in the 1970s when I was growing up, Peter. Um, my mother received a copy, a subscription to Ms. Magazine in 1973, uh, long after she had divorced. But I remember, and it was a gift to, to her, and I would read it. And uh, so it was a very, it was, it was a time in our country, too, when the sort of pro-woman forces were really out. Uh, and and try and taking over, but I was raised in that house with my mother, her mother, and two of my mother's unmarried sisters. And additionally, my my one married aunt was important in my life as well. But I was raised to be a conservative without them ever saying the word. I can't recall a single political conversation. How was it? A Religion? Few you went to mass? Family? Yes, we certainly did. I went to Catholic school. We went to mass regularly. But even beyond that, it was always about family and faith. A little bit of self denial be a giver, not a taker, uh, that your family, your name, and your family are really all that we have, and it's the most important thing that you can protect and that you can enhance throughout your life is your, is your name and your family. And that's been true my whole life, and I try to pass it on to my own four children. But Peter, it was also because I came from a family of small business owners, emphasis on small. Uh. But they were, just, they were self-reliant, and they were industrious, and they were gritty. And they and sent determined. you to pick blueberries for eight they summers did. in a yes, row. Yes, we did. And yes, I did. And that I learned a lot on that blueberry farm. I, I learned negotiation. I learned the honest day's work for honest day's pay for an honest day's work. I learned uh, collegiality and teamwork. I also learned really the value of the value of money at a young age because we didn't have a lot of it. But I never knew that. Uh, the other thing is that. I'm sure I know that all the women in my household voted for John Kennedy. You know, he was handsome and Catholic, and they were Democrats. But as time went on, I was very inspired by Ronald Reagan in 1980, and that does not make me unique, but it makes me very blessed because I was, in 1984, I was assigned by my high school to write for the local newspaper. And I was going into my senior year. I was not old enough to vote for Ronald Reagan. I missed it by a few months. But I was in charge of watching the two national conventions and writing about it. And I was really excited to know that Geraldine Ferraro, a woman, an right. Italian woman, right. like me, right. well spoken, I was raised in a, in a house of Italian women, well, wonderful woman, God rest her soul, that she was going to, she was chosen to be the vice presidential running mate for Walter Mondale. So I was really excited to watch that Democratic National Convention. And they went first, party out of power. And I thought she was great. But as I listened to all of the speeches, I was a little astonished, um, a lot of government, you know, a lot of things, that, a lot of pie-in-the-sky promises I just didn't think were realistic. But then I heard Ronald Reagan the next week. And here is a man who was literally four times my age. I was 17. He was 68, I believe, or maybe older. 68, right. And he was from a different coast, obviously a different gender, and he spoke to me because it was aspirational and uplifting. And it was pro-America and American and her allies and her interests abroad. And I think in many ways that's what you ended up hearing from Donald Trump this year. You, you heard him make the case. He had a very simple slogan. He never left it, make America great again. Some people tried to read cynicism in there. All he meant was very simple. You could take from it what you want, that you're protecting America, American workers, American interests, patriotism, um, the idea that a country has to have borders and sovereignty, uh, the idea that we should be looking out for each other and for our nation here and abroad. So it's, you know, it's a wonderful way of growing up. It's a gift that keeps on giving. Um, and in many ways, it prepared me for this moment because to remain calm and to remain a little self-deprecating, a little self-denying, and humble. I was raised with tremendous humility. And maybe others refuse to say it, but there was, you know, for all his strength and all his toughness and all his brilliance, Donald Trump is very humbled by being elected president of the United States. I see it. He's How do you very see it? How does it come out? 
I, he's very aware because he wants to listen. He wants to take the counsel of many people. He's been incredibly gracious, if not magnanimous, to so many people who attacked him mercilessly. Dinner His last night with Mitt opponent. Romney. As, as we sit here, the report is that he and Mitt Romney had dinner last night. They did. And, and beyond that, it, yes, and Mitt Romney was incredibly critical of Donald Trump, viciously critical. Uh, but even his political opponents, like Hillary Clinton or Barack Obama, they attacked him mercilessly. In, in the case of Hillary Clinton, through paid advertising, through her words, mm -hmm. through mm -hmm. her surrogates. And he, you know, less than 30 hours after being elected president of the United States, Donald and Melania Trump came to Washington to meet with. President Obama and First Lady Michelle Obama and have had nothing but wonderful things to say about that meeting and about their shared love of this country and their desire and indeed resolve to have a peaceful transition of power from Barack Obama to Donald Trump as president. He's been incredibly magnanimous and open to He's received calls. I've been there when he's received calls from Carly Farina and Jeb Bush and John Kasich, you know, these former rivals. Ted Cruz came to visit recently. That's what a leader does. A leader does not focus on petty grievances and who zinged whom when. A leader understands, as Donald Trump said right after he was elected that night, that morning, Peter, that he's going to be the president of all Americans, not just those who voted for him. You got to know Donald Trump when you and your husband bought an apartment in a Trump building in 2001. And you joined the condo board and discovered that Donald Trump pays a lot of attention to his condos. Yes. So this is Donald Trump at the age of 55. How did you get to know him? What were your first impressions? You became friends. I think you talked about politics with him. This is a generation, literally a generation ago. What was that Donald Trump like? That's the Donald Trump I see now as the president-elect. Um, focused, engaging, looks people in the eye, asks questions, is funny. You found him likable from I'm the get-go. Incredibly likable, incredibly likable, and, and also inspiration on. I think America has seen that, certainly through his presidential campaign, but even before that, they knew him through The Apprentice or they knew him as a successful businessman. I can't even say entrepreneur, but a successful businessman who shows grit and determination and ingenuity. Those are attractive qualities to me. I am a small business owner. And uh, his questions, you know, I think politics has always interested him. He's always been a big fan of public policy and politics. Mm -hmm. And he would ask me, knowing what my line of work is, ask me about public opinion, about politics, and we struck up a friendship. I go to see him maybe in his office a few times a year, or I would see him maybe out at different events in New York. And it's an easy friendship with Donald Trump, um, but it's also, you know, I call him my friend. I am very respectful toward the fact that he was my candidate, he was my boss, and we're not peers. I was there, I'm there to serve him. So you mentioned your business. You were a professional pollster. At what point? 15 years ago, did you say to yourself, you hang up the phone with Donald Trump, and did you ever say to yourself, you know, that guy could actually make a pretty good candidate someday? Yes. What I always thought about Donald Trump and told him, told him again in 2011 when he flirted with running and told him in 2015 when I met with him before he announced about possibly joining his campaign in 2015. Peter, I always believed that if Donald Trump would announce his run for president, that people would follow. It's when they think you're maybe not serious because you've got this successful career right. in this whole other life right. outside of politics. When they, they, they love the idea of it, but if you don't execute on the idea, then people don't like to be disappointed. They don't right. like to waste their time with something that's not going to happen. So my presumption, and Donald Trump has told me that his wife Melania told him the same thing at the time or over the years, that when you actually announce, then you'll really see how people respond to your candidacy and likely it will be positive. I just also knew as a pollster that the American voters' wish list, their job description for an ideal presidential candidate, was one that did not necessarily have political experience or even military experience. But the question for America was always if and when you get the chance to make good on that self-avowed desire to have someone from outside the system, will you? Uh, we all know anybody's tried to lose his last 10 pounds or win the Powerball knows saying it doesn't make it so. Right. And yet here they had the opportunity and they did it. And the other thing is that just businessmen like Donald Trump, who are wildly successful and who are job creators, the man has employed tens of thousands of people over the years, they are accountable for results. They must perform, they must deliver. There's none of this, we'll get to that next time, we'll have a commission, uh, we have divided government, there's nothing we can do. And I think it's- So uh, what made Trump better, a better candidate than Romney? 
Romney was a tremendously accomplished businessman, of course. He was always afraid to talk about it. Romney really did not embrace his wealth and his business experience. He would talk a little bit about it. I always thought for Governor Romney, whom I supported as the nominee and did what I could do to help, I always thought with Governor Romney that one thing he could have done was explain to the country what venture capitalism is or what private equity is in the following way, because it was difficult for people to understand what he had done at Bain. Right. Stand with the people from, was it Circuit City? Or Staples, I think, Sta was one. Staples, Staples, Staples was a right. big one. So stand with the people from Staples and said, ladies and gentlemen, this is what I do. This is what I did at Bain Capital. We create companies like this, or we, we help them flourish. Right. We give them the tools. We give them a, right. And these are the employees who benefit from that. There is none of that. Also, I just think if you're going to be, if you're going to run a typical campaign, you're going to get a typical result for a Republican. And this year, where Hillary Clinton started with a blue wall of 239 electoral votes, I was not going to sit around and wait for her to find the other 31. Okay. I think it was 244, and we were going to reach over and dip into her cash. Let's, let's go to August. Let's go to August. This is according to a profile of you in the New Yorker magazine. Conversation on August 12th. You're in Donald Trump's office, and it goes like this. We're losing, Conway told him. That was him. me. <laughs> that was you. We're losing, Conway told him. No, look at the polls, Trump replied. I've looked at the polls, Conway said. We're losing but we don't have to lose. There's a pathway back. Okay, look, you just pulled off one of the biggest political events in American history. When you were talking to that man on August 12th, most of the polls showed him 10 points down. What did you see that even he himself apparently didn't see? What did you see? First, let me say, well, I saw a winner. I saw a winner in Donald Trump, and I saw someone at that point who America saw when they shoot up at his rallies, when they would call the office or email or spend money that maybe they didn't have at their disposal to buy his hats and his shirts and his bumper stickers. They felt like they were part of a movement. I saw a winner. I saw a disruptor, a change maker. You know, the girl from South Jersey, that was an important part of your background because that's the kind of people who responded to him, right? Every time I went to a rally, I saw the people I grew up with, and I saw in them me, because I'll always be that person. And I also saw my party veering dangerously close to becoming the party of the elites, whether it was some of the candidates they nominated up and down the ballot, some of the positions they were taking, parts of the autopsy, frankly, from four, three or four years mm -hmm. earlier, um, and certainly just, I think, the outsized importance that was given to some of the donors or the consultants or the, the statist right. ideas. And so he brought the party really from veering dangerously close to becoming the party of the elites to becoming the party of the worker, the forgotten man and forgotten woman, as he famously said. But let me say something, too. I think the other people on the team don't get the credit they deserve because I'm very high profile. One of his spokespeople, maybe one of the most obvious spokespeople for him. Um, and yes, I was his campaign manager, and I want the record to reflect and people to remember. It was Donald J. Trump who elevated a woman to his campaign manager. No one else in Republican politics had done that. Can you tell us about Steve Bannon? Yeah, who's Steve's keeping, who's kept off camera, Kellyanne is on camera, Steve Bannon is off camera, and now he's reviled every, you Google on Steve Bannon and the first thousand things that come up are not complimentary. Well, it's really unfortunate and it's completely undeserved. Tell us. Steve is a master tactician. He's also a product of Catholic schools and Catholic upbringing. He was a naval officer. He was a vice president at Goldman Sachs. He uh, has, as has been reported, he has some of the rights to Seinfeld because he very brilliantly he a good deal created the deal, right. created the deal. <laughs> right. At a time, I think in the first season of Seinfeld, it was not a highly rated show, if I recall or I've read. And so he took a chance and there you go. So here's somebody and then he built a, you know, built a website and, and a brand in his friend Andrew Breitbart's name who right. died suddenly four or five years ago to everybody's shock. Um, Steve was such a big part of our team, and Steve and I are a really good complementary team. And Donald Trump trusts him, and he's bringing him to the White House. And in this day and age, Peter, I don't think it'll strike anybody as hashtag breaking news for me to say that it's so easy to focus on the negative about anyone or anything. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, people will always find something negative if they want about someone. But what they should look at is you know, how much Steve Bannon is dedicated to the pres president-elect and this incoming administration, how 
important he was to so much of our strategy and tactics. Okay, so you, Steve Bannon, and above all the president-elect, at what moment does that group take a deep breath and say, we can get Pennsylvania? It would also include we, people like- we can, we can get Michigan. It would also include people like Jared Kushner, his son-in-law, who helped build, with, along with Brad Parscale, helped to build a great data and digital operation. Um, we also had other fabulous people on the campaign. People who've been there from day one, like okay, so that, that, If I may, that, Lawson, that from the here. point of view Stephen of- Stephen Miller, the speechwriter. Stephen Miller, uh, so the point of view of nuts and bolts of politics. Outspent by Hillary Clinton by at least 10 to one is my impression. She put together a ground game. There are uh, unions getting people to the polls for her and volunteers, field offices all over the country. But you had a good data operation. We did. We had a ground team and a data operation. But everybody kept saying, even friends of mine on TV would say they have no, I call them the wrist flickers. Oh, they have no campaign. They have no ground game. They have no data operation. It was never true. And, but it also didn't, what people said didn't matter. What we had mattered very much. And what we had was a sophisticated way to target voters by first, Peter, not presuming who they are and how they were going to vote. Uh, we also saw early on, we let people tell us how they felt. We also saw early on what everybody saw, but I guess opted to ignore in the end, which is number one, this was a change election. Right. This was 1992 and right. 2008 all over again in that the person who represents change and fresh face and new blood and not the status quo prevailed. It's the same thing ironically with the other Clinton, the successful Clinton presidentially, Bill Clinton and Barack Obama, and now Donald Trump. Uh, the other thing that we saw early on that never changed is that Hillary Clinton was really struggling to attract and coalesce the Obama coalition, the millennials, the voters of color, so you saw you you recognized she was never she quite own 47% able to pull her problem. people together. That's Got right. it. She had her okay. own forty-seven percent problem in that Mitt Romney famously had a different one. Hers was we just and I said this on TV, but nobody thought it mattered. 40, she would be at 44, 46, 47 percent right. in all of these states that President Obama carried twice with well over fifty percent. Right. Those undecided voters were not going to go for the status quo. Right. The one thing that the undecided voters were very decided about was Hillary Clinton. And she actually could never overcome the integrity and honesty deficit that she had long before Comey on October 28th. So, do you know what I hear you saying? I hear you saying, look, we were just running a good campaign. We saw this, and we saw this, and we saw this, and frankly, those were things for everybody to see who was paying attention. You almost sound puzzled that other campaigns missed what seemed obvious to you. It would be most of the media, not just other campaigns. And, and, and oh, you mean other campaigns in the past? Yeah. Well, perhaps, but this is a very you different don't, thing. You don't sound like somebody who said we had a terrific secret formula that nobody else. You're just saying we were. We doing did some things differently because when you're underfunded and you're yep. understaffed, meaning Hillary had, I, I'm told over in Brooklyn, she had one person looking at one county, and there'd be like a person in charge of one county, Lackawanna County in Pennsylvania, I'm like, wow, because I have somebody on five states. But in any event, hundreds of counties. But even if, if that's not true, of course we had less money and less right. personnel right. than Team Clinton, but it forces you to be what the American dream is all about, which is be gritty, be hardy, be okay. ingenious, be entrepreneurial. But I wanted to say this too. Pennsylvania was what I call my reach state, like a reach college. Yes. And it oh, it's called the Republicans fool's gold. It never quite works out. Right. I have to tell you, it always felt like a Donald Trump state. Every time we were there, that the, the size of the rallies, the message, if you if you matched up the demographics and with it with the with, with the issue sets that people said motivated them with his message, that's a place. Pennsylvania is a place where a couple of things happened. One is he was able to elevate issues like trade and illegal immigration right. in a way that people looked at it through an economic and fairness lens. They'd say, you know, it's really not fair. Let me give you one example. Cambria County, Pennsylvania. Yep. This is old, played out, steelmaking country. Barack Obama carried Cambria County in 2008, and, but it swung to Donald Trump who carried Cambria County by 38 points. These are working people. Many of these people haven't had a good job since the steel mills closed, and that's more than a decade ago. How is it that a billionaire from New York who attended the University of Pennsylvania, an Ivy League institution, how does this happen that he goes to Cambria County and sweeps it? He's the best connector with people I've ever seen. 
and he's an excellent communicator. I knew we were going to win a couple, a couple different times, but one thing really struck me and it answers your question. In the ABC News Washington Post poll, which showed us losing 50 to 38, which wasn't true, but then everybody had to own that poll when five days later we were within one point, they had a question that didn't get a lot of play. And their question, you're familiar with this question, but they asked the question probably two weeks before the election. Which candidate shares concerns about people like you or understands concerns about people like you? Empathy, right. you know, connection. Mitt Romney had lost that by 82 to 10, famously, right. Right. against Barack Obama. Hillary, 46, Trump, 43. I looked at that and I said, whoa, this is really adding up to something big, like victory. Because the idea that the first female president of the United States, who also happens to be running for Barack Obama's third term, or we can argue Bill Clinton's third term at right. some level, who's with the Democratic Party that's supposed to be in touch with people's concerns and a voice for the a voice for the forgotten, is tied with Donald Trump, who you just described, right. on the empathy measure, on the connection measure. I knew we were going to win because that's a remarkable number. Now you put it in a place like Cambria County, or even put it in a place like Mahoning County, Ohio, which Donald Trump lost two or three points to Hillary Clinton, but which Barack Obama had carried 62 to 36 or something like that. So the Trump goes up 10, right. she goes down 14 from that. And the swings were huge, and it was the message and the messenger and the delivery. The message was, I'm going to renegotiate these bad trade deals because our jobs have been shipped to Mexico and China. And people were like, he's absolutely right. I'm going to get rid of Obamacare because it basically has a penalty, a tax. Plus, you can't buy, you can't buy health care the way you buy auto insurance and so many goods and services in our Amazon.com world. Um, and, and you should have a health savings account that helps you control more the most intimate personal exercise and commerce, your health care decisions. And, and people heard that. They heard about illegal immigration. And what Donald Trump did with the illegal immigration was remarkable to me. He took that issue, and it was no longer just a question of what's fair to the illegal immigrant. Right. He was asking, hey, what's fair to the American worker? What's fair to our local economy? What's fair to, what's, what's fair to our sovereignty, our borders? And he made people think about issues that were really bubbling below the surface and mired in single digits. One more question about the campaign. I'd like to come to what we can expect over the next few weeks as well. But one more question about the campaign. Agree 100%, get it, that he said things about immigration. He put these issues on the table that no other, none of the other 16 Republicans were talking about. And he did it from the get-go. That famous scene, he takes the escalator down in Trump Tower, and in his announcement speech, before he had hired Kellyanne Conway, Trade and immigration are right there. Yep. Where did it come from? This, is, this guy didn't focus test all that stuff. He's not been reading policy journals for the last decade. Where, where does the, are we dealing with some kind of intuitive political genius? Where, where, where did he it come from? He is an from? intuitive political genius. And I think part of why Donald Trump's an intuitive political genius is because he's not a politician. And he, spent, he has spent his career, indeed his life, being the intuitive genius without the political part. So you just add that in there. I, I was struck by something, I think it was his son Eric said, um, it may have been Don Jr., so excuse me, but I, I read it in a print quote. But one of his sons said that, look, we try to learn new things. He said when, you know, my, my siblings and I have learned all about the real estate business. And then it was going to be golf courses, so we learned about that. But then my father went on to be apprentice, so we learned very quickly about show business and, enter and entertainment mm -hmm. and viewers, not just consumers. And now we're in politics and we'll learn that too. And I thought, that is really brilliant. And it was so true. I think when you're new to something and you already have all this experience and productivity in a different industry, your mind is nimble and it's fertile and it's willing to learn and, and adapt. Um, but I will tell you, in August of 2014, I released a poll at the Heritage Foundation. Right. It was a poll done for a, a group of people who wanted to talk about the illegal, talk about immigration. And it was right before the 2014 midterms. And that poll showed that Americans look at immigration through many different lenses, but they really look at it through an economic lens. And you even had, you know, people believe, they, they believe in, uh, they, they, they believe in having a reasonable policy. They believe in waiting in line. They believe that, they, they do not believe, which was very much the opinion of a lot of elites in both parties, that illegal immigrants are here to do the jobs Americans want, don't want to do. They believe that may be true as a fact, factual statement, 
but they believe that it shouldn't be true. Shouldn't be so. That if you want to support yourself and your family, you have to do what all of our ancestors did, which is go find a job. And there were many to find. And so that was a real, in talking about fairness and everyday affordability and security, uh, I think that was, those were very important issues, but he's the one willing and smart enough to tap into that where others were, hey, I'm going to be a job creator, job creator. Okay, well, we tried that, but 7% of the country are job creators. 7% of the country are job seekers. We were trying to talk to the vast majority of households that were job holders. Right, right. Issues coming at us now. The president-elect called for tax cuts, and he's called for regulatory rollback, pro-growth. He's also called for protectionism of various kinds, and this is hard to pin down, but he's called for infrastructure spending, and I think there's a report that Wilbur Ross authored that used the figure of a trillion dollars. That's now what everybody's using, a trillion dollar infrastructure program. This is a little confusing. Are we getting, who's showing up on January 20th? A pro-growth, tax-reforming chief executive? Yes. Or a big government, protectionist. No. So here's the thing. I had a feeling you'd be able this to explain country, this to this me, country, thank you, Thank you, Peter. This country doesn't build anything anymore. We don't have these great projects. Where's the next Hoover Dam? Why are our bridges and roads and tunnels and our infrastructure either crumbling or underwhelming or overburdened or all of the above? Why? We pay the gas tax. We, we've, we've spent trillions of dollars in government money. You want a professional builder and problem solver and fixer to be the head of all this. And he very much believes and heard an awful lot from voters all right. across this country that what affects them every day of their lives is traffic and congestion and unpaved roads and bridges that are crumbling and a lack of, you know, a lack of a way to just get around. Um, and, and, and frankly, a lot of this is local and state in nature, certainly. But we're talking about bigger things. This country, Donald Trump said, we don't make anything with our hands anymore. And, and we don't make anything big. We don't dream big. So he's going to dream big. But I'm telling you, infrastructure is, it is an unsung issue on people's minds. It's very important to them. If you listen to them long enough, you realize, sure, jobs, healthcare, right. education, we get all that. But this is something people are talking about at the clip. The other thing is, he is a pro-growth conservative right. president-elect. And he will be. He has put forth a a job creation plan that was co-authored by Reagan economist, create 25 million jobs over the next 10 years, unleash energy, shale and coal and natural gas, hydraulic factoring, uh, do the infrastructure spending, but also... But see, can I just add, on yeah. the infrastructure spending, I've heard Larry Kudlow, for example, says, now wait a minute, that trillion dollar figure includes liquid natural gas facilities. That'll be spent by private companies. That's right big pipeline, that'll be spent by private companies. Much of this will be spent by the, uh, the president-elect wants to encourage infrastructure spending, but it's not as if he's going to engage in a trillion well, dollars. Well, that's right. That's that right. right, it's not a big government. Oh, 100%, okay. so I should have mentioned that. To, no, me that's important. Right. to me, it's an obvious point. I should have mentioned it, meaning this is a guy who's going to tap into the private sector, private industry. Look at what happened okay. just this week. T tomorrow, as I sit here, Vice President-elect Mike Pence, who also is the governor of Indiana, President-elect Donald Trump will go to Indianapolis and they will stand with Carrier, maker of air conditioners, as Carrier announces its decision to indeed stay in Indiana with 1,200 jobs and not ship them off to Mexico, as was the plan. That is incredible. That is not heavy-handed government intervention. That is Donald Trump saying to America, if not the world, the USA is open for business again, and that you as Carrier or you as any company thinking or in fact having shipped your jobs overseas to Mexico, China, or somewhere else, that when we roll back useless regulations, when we have a more hospitable business climate, when we make it easier and indeed attractive to businesses, to employers, to set up shop here and to expand and to grow and to retain their workforce, the results will follow. Okay, so on, on the economy, think growth. Think growth. Think growth. That's also, by the way, that's also in his 25 million job creation plan over 10 years. And people say, oh, you can't pay for it. Part of how he pays for it is he's bullish, he's ambitious, he's Donald Trumpian on growth. Why are we settling for this right. anemic growth? When, when did we become so inured 
to how much we can do better and brighter. And that's just who he is. Right. Listen, can I do it? Leslie Stahl, another quotation from Leslie Stahl. Some of his campaign issues were not meant to be taken seriously, but as opening bids for a negotiation. On others, he's firm. C could I do a very brief lightning round and you tell me whether he's firm or whether we should expect adjustments? In I don't know if the lightning round is the way to approach that. I'm sorry, respectfully. <laughs> okay. because, what um, passes for lightning round on this show? Well, but again, we know who he is on each issue. And then the question is, for example, he says, build the wall of Mexico, pay for it. That's, of course, where I'm going to go. Okay. He's firm on that. He said it many times. Okay. Uh, go ahead. No, that's, uh, that's, that's exactly what But that's look, I want to say leaders listen you know, and as learn, you know, there are and they people... negotiate. Okay. They don't, you know, people who want to criticize him will say, oh, he moderated, he modulated, he flip-flopped. He, he's, he's a master negotiator. This guy knows how to get deals done and produce results. So it's not always going to make everyone happy. But his commitment is to the American people. What will make them more safe and more prosperous? Supreme Court. He'll choose a nominee from that list of 21? Very firm about the type of justice that he will, justice is, since he expects to have three, maybe four. Yay. Amazing. And, uh, and, and it, I'm sorry, Peter. No. From that list of 20, but also just, I think what's most important about that list is, is what, how he said he came about having that list, which right. is they have to be in the mold of Justice Antonin Scalia, who's untimely death. Uh, God rest his soul, created this vacancy last, last year, uh, earlier this year. So he is, and I think that that particular issue carried the day with lots of Republicans and conservatives in that Not he got 90% of Republicans in the end. And all these polls showed him at 74, 76% of Republicans. That wasn't true except for a couple of times, but it also is important that people know this guy is going to be in charge of the Supreme Court nominees, sure. But federal judicial nominees, those will total the hundreds probably, or thereabouts, maybe 150. I mean, can I, one more from him, yes. abortion. Here he, is, here he is in Manhattan. I know it. He didn't, uh, I can't find a single quotation during the campaign in which he sounded even remotely apologetic or hesitant about a position in which on the island where he lives is overwhelmingly unpopular. That's right. Is there a personal sense of conviction? What, what, how did There's this happen? There's a personal sense of conviction. Donald Trump tells the story about how he came to his pro-life views. It, it, not a story, but he tells about the account of his friend who was facing an unplanned pregnancy later in her life and just how transformative her decision and the child that was eventually born affected him. But it's also a matter, it's just what he believes. It is a core conviction, which is why he's so passionate about it. Peter, I have been waiting 25 years for someone, let alone a presidential nominee for the Republican Party, to give as, as an impassioned defense for the unborn as Donald Trump did on October 19th at that debate in Las Vegas. I've been working on this messaging for years, and you and get people who are 100% pro-life, they get all the awards, they love babies, and they're just not willing to articulate it in a way that grips the consciousness. He's absolutely right. If you're not if you haven't made up your mind about abortion based on your re religious views or your lack of religious views, and that's up to an individual, then at least let science and medicine step into the breach. And he did that that night by saying to Hillary Clinton, she had a terrible response. You would rip the baby out of its mother's womb right before it's born, hours before it's born, she did. How is she going to defend against that? It is the Democratic Party that has become so incredibly extreme on the issue of abortion. Their platform, I've memorized it, is essentially abortion anyone, anytime, anywhere. They are against any and all regulations or restrictions. So the question is for them, not for the pro-lifers. The question is for them. This Can you think of any, any situation where abortion is not a good idea? Eighth month, ninth month, sex selection, you don't want another daughter, uh, taxpayer-funded abortion, fetal pain when nonpartisan scientists say the fetus can feel pain at about 20 weeks. We know it's before that, but we'll put it at 20 weeks. And so the list goes on and on in terms of, uh, of how extreme the left has become on abortion. By the way, where are the pro-life Democrats? Where are these people? They've been purged from their party along with the blue dog and bull weevil Democrats, and frankly, with very few exceptions, the Second Amendment Democrats. Kelly, and that, so, so from, from, but back to you for a moment. You and I have known each other for a long time. You've been a hardworking professional woman in a man's world. Polling business, when you went into it, was utterly dominated by men. I think it probably still is it dominated still by is. men. Okay. And there you are, 
moving back and forth between this town and Manhattan, you yourself have always been pro-life. And you know, I think there were moments when your career would have been easier for you if you just kept your mouth shut. And more lucrative. And more lucrative. All I, all I had to why? do. Why? Why does that, why, why? Oh, because I believe that. I believe if we're a nation that doesn't protect our most vulnerable, then we should do some self-examination. And, and Peter, I don't want the people calling and screaming at you, oh, well, what about rape and incest? What? Let's focus on what we're talking about here. Who are we as a nation overall? And this goes to elder care as well. Are we going to, are we just going to tell people past a certain age, you've had a great life, just let it, really? It's not my decision. But also, also, um, for me, it's if you, if you believe in something and you're passionate about it and not emotional about it, you tend to attract many more adherents. My life wouldn't have just been easier as a professional woman in polling. It would have been far more lucrative because many times I was offered a very large check from the other side of this issue and other issues if I would just put my name on a right. data set or just put my name on a project. But, right. um, and I'm an imperfect person, imperfect professional. But, but at the same time, I believe if you adhere to principle in this business, uh, you, the, the luck and the success comes along for most people. Okay. Can I, a few closing questions, but first I just have to ask, mm -hmm. we mentioned Don, president, the president-elect, and I'm still having trouble with this, I'll get it, but the president-elect Trump and Governor Romney had dinner last night. Decision-making in this campaign, you've said he makes the central decisions. Absolutely. Romney comes in and ha meets him a couple of weeks weekends ago at Bedminster. I was there. And then there's a lot of stuff in the press, including my friend Kellyanne Conway, saying, I'm not so sure, we're getting a lot of pushback on Mitt Romney, uh, we want party loyalty, but do we need to give away the Secretary of State to get it? And then, what was it yesterday? I mean, I'm a layman, I live in California, I read the newspapers when I see your name, because we've known each other, so what, what is she up to now? And then, what was it, Morning Joe, there was an unsourced quotation saying that Donald Trump was furious with Kellyanne Con What, this is all, just, just explain, is this one example well, of something that got furious. out of hand? What happened? Yeah, he wasn't what furious. Happened? Tell us what happened. And people should think about their sources. No one on TV is ever under oath or their secret sources. Right. You, you and your viewers want to read the New York Times article by Michael Shear and Maggie Haberman in response to all of that because that Donald right. Trump is quoted in there. Okay. And it gets the whole, our entire relationship and my position in his orbit, my position perhaps in, in the future, his future administration, but also this particular situation. I would never say anything publicly that I had not expressed privately to Donald Trump and I would never purposely try to hurt or embarrass him. That was my point about the blowback that I saw everywhere right. with respect to Governor Romney possibly being the Secretary of State or really any position. Peter, it struck me. I was reporting the news, reflecting the sentiments, not trying to create them. It struck me that on the week when Donald Trump told the New York Times He's looking at the Paris Accords on climate change. He'd rethought his position on waterboarding based on conversations he had had with generals. And that he was not focused on prosecuting Hillary Clinton. He knows right. that that's not up to him as the president, but right. he just was saying, I'm not focused on that. And in a week when he said that, the blowback about Mitt Romney for Secretary of State from the grassroots, and frankly from a lot of Mitt Romney supporters, but they just don't have the courage to say so publicly, but I have all the information, I have all the communication was breathtaking. That this was the main source of people saying, please don't do that. And it's, you know, it's something about loyalty, but it's also about people in the party and the larger movement feel like we're moving on to a new era in the Republican Party and the conservative movement. It is more about the worker and the forgotten man or forgotten woman. It's not about the elites. Um, and I just, you know, have said, I've said all I wanted to say publicly, but I just, Mitt Romney went out of his way to hurt Donald Trump, and Donald Trump didn't deserve it. Mitt Romney is welcome to say what he wants to say about anyone, but I only wish he had been as harsh in hitting Hillary Clinton, and frankly, President Obama's legacy on certain issues that I would hope Mitt Romney doesn't agree with now since he ran against those issues you do four me a years favor? ago. Would you do me a favor? Remind me never to cross you. Oh, no, <laughs> I am. <laughs> well, it's not that. By the way, I never draw first blood. That's the truth no. about me. 
I really, I, I pride myself on being a very optimistic, positive person, as Saturday Night Live says, walking on sunshine. But when attacked, when somebody I care about is being unfairly attacked, then the game is on. Okay, a few final questions here. You went to work, after you got your law degree, you went to work for Dick Worthlin. I did. Ronald, Ronald Reagan's pollster. You have been not merely a pollster, but a member of the conservative movement, really since you were a girl. And now we have fellow conservatives, conservatives such as George Will, Bill Kristol, the editors of National Review. National Review, which used to be the conservative magazine, all opposed your candidate, Mr. Trump. What do you say to your fellow conservatives now? Welcome aboard. I hope we can count on your support. I know you love the country, and you would not have wanted Hillary Clinton to be president. And so you got your wish on that. I would tell them the water is warm. Come on in. And that I always have an outstretched hand. Um, Donald Trump was brutalized by some of these people and slandered. And, and frankly, I said earlier in your broadcast, Peter, that the idea that many in the media never even, never even conceived that perhaps she would lose and he would win means that they're still, I think they're in their still stages of grief, anger, denial, but it's time for acceptance and it's time for cooperation, frankly. There's got to be something in his plans that animates you. There has to be something that reminds you. You feel no impulse to write people out of the conservative movement. No, they I don't. They got Donald Trump wrong, so they're gone. We're moving no, on. I, no, no, I don't. I don't. But I think some humility right. from them would be in order. If we're being magnanimous and gracious, it would be good to see that from some. Um, and look, people have lost friendships over this presidential race. I hear it every day. I see it. I hear it from people who stop me in the street wherever I am in the country or the world. They'll stop. And I'm just the consultant. Imagine what they're saying to Donald Trump. He's the president-elect and, and Mike Pence, the vice president-elect. But they're saying, you know, nobody at work talks to me or I was vilified on my college campus or all. So I actually think find a way to help support the new president-elect. I do think some of them, not the ones you mentioned necessarily by name, but there are some people within the larger conservative movement who seem a little bit timid to try to approach us, and they should not. I've heard from senators who did not support him and were very public about it. He's taken calls from them. He's taken calls from his former rivals in the presidential race. And listen to what Donald Trump said moments after he was certified the winner, or moments after it was announced he had won the presidency three weeks ago, which is, I will be the president of all Americans, not just the ones who supported me. And I would say that's the message to everyone. Couple of final questions. I know you well enough to know that you're very serious about being a good mom. You have four kids and you're very serious about being a wife. How's your life going to work? Well, it's going to work with a cheerful chaos. It always seems to work. Um, I'm one of these women who I got married at 34, had my first children at 37, had two of them in my 40s. So I've sequen my life ended up being sequenced maybe part by choice, part by circumstance, but it was sequence. And I think that's what a lot of American women are doing now. And you have to make, you have to make choices, Peter. It's different for the woman. I'll just say that as right, somebody who just right. was the, as you say, first female successful campaign manager, fine. But it's different for the mom. And that is still true. And that's something I would remind my three daughters when they're old enough to really understand that and my son. But uh, my life is going to work because I have a supportive husband and a supportive family structure, even though they don't live close by. They're incredibly helpful to us. Um, I will have people helping us in the house. I've never had live-in help, but I've had people helping us over the years who, are, who love my kids and are phenomenal. Um, and also just by having my priorities in order. You know, when you become a mom, there's a certain piece of yourself that gets completely subsumed into being their mother. And I welcomed that completely a long time ago. I don't remember the last movie I saw. I don't remember the last book I read for pleasure. So you make choices. And they will always come first. And Donald Trump sees in his own daughter, Ivanka, and his sons, Don Jr., who has five children with his wife, Vanessa, he sees with Eric and Laura, who are fairly newlyweds, but he, 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 see, he knows, he has a 10-year-old son, Baron, right. and Tiffany. He, he knows the value of being a great hands-on parent while you're a professional. But it's all a matter of priorities. And I, I do, I've been quoted and I do tease, like, I'm a man by day. You know, if my best friend said, to call and said, I'm pregnant with triplets and I'm going to be the first woman on Mars and I just hit the Powerball lottery, I'd say, you have to call me Saturday. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, 
And that's, you know, that's a, a bit of an over-exaggeration, but the point is focus on what you're doing at that moment and get it done. I think a lot of people just complain about how little time they have, and it's a waste of time to complain about how little time you have. But um, I feel very blessed to be part of this historic effort, and I feel very grateful to Donald Trump and Mike Pence for giving me this opportunity. But my children feel grateful too. They sense that there's something meaningful here of which they were a part. They're old enough to get that. They're old enough to get that, and they see, you know, sometimes they're teased in school because of what mom does, but oftentimes they, they run into peers who are just generally excited about fresh face and new blood. You know, Donald Trump has stature, he's presence, and he's, and they, it's, a, it's an exciting time. Our family expects to move here to Washington, D.C., a place I lived from, from when I was 18 for 20 years. And so we're excited about new beginnings, and I'm very excited to help support this administration to my highest and best use. I'll be very frank with you. Donald Trump asked me what I'd like to do in his administration. He's been nothing but generous and gracious to me in terms of what role should I have. And the fact is, I looked at some of those big jobs, and I did not see mother of four small children listed in any of the descriptions, and that's okay. So we will find a way to, you know, maybe, maybe I'll show America's women how to you know, maybe we can Skype a little bit from, from the recital or from homework, or maybe we can FaceTime homework here and there. In addition to being there, I try to be home every night if I'm not on the road one or two nights a week. And that's important. Be fully present for the kids is what I've seen. Because I think a lot of people trick, like, we're, oh, we're all together, the family's all together, and who's on this screen, and who's in that TV, and who's right. in that part of the house? Right. I never believed in quality time when I was single and didn't have children. I'm like, ugh. And there's something to it, but um, they matter, and they're at these ages where they both understand, but they also need their mom. Last question. This is a tweet from Kellyanne Conway. Kate McKinnon has me down. <laughs> so listen, I just have to ask, what's it like to be the subject of skits on Saturday Night Live? Oh, it's adorable. I think if you're going to be mocked by Saturday Night Live, it, it should be with a kind of affection that, that they've attempted, uh, that they've done this, this year. I thought Kellyanne Conway's day off was so funny. Most of it was true. I've never done yoga, although I should. Um, I'm, I'm anxious to, to trade in my spank, my control top pantyhose for a Pilates reformer, believe me. Um, but it's it's fun. You know, it's part of pop culture. I mean, that's Do Donald the kids Trump, like though. It? The kids, the kids like get a kick out of it. They each had a cameo, I guess, of sorts. They even had the three girls, and boy, we do make a lot of pancakes in my house. Um, but it was it's affectionate mocking, I guess, is, would be the word, parodying. Uh, but look, politics is big business, and right. pop culture and politics, I think, got a bi got a real boost with Donald Trump as a Republican nominee, and now indeed as the President of the United States, because he is, you know, what was he first? He's this just larger-than-life personality, successful businessman who then was also an incredibly successful TV guy. The Apprentice was the highest-rated show when he had it on the air at the beginning, and you know, very he did he knows TV, he knows media. Um, but it's fun, but I, I, I deign to think that now Kate McKinnon, who played both Hillary Clinton and Kellyanne Conway in Saturday Night Live, realized where her future lies, at least for the rest of the season. <laughs> <laughs> Kellyanne Conway, who on January 20th will celebrate her 50th, 50th birthday That's right. and watch her client take the oath of office as the 45th President of the United States. It'll be an amazing night. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, Peter. From the offices of the Hoover Institution in Washington, D.C., for Uncommon Knowledge, I'm Peter Robinson. Thank you.